Our first scripture reading is Psalm 13 from the New Revised Standard Version. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death, and my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Our second scripture is Psalm 79. O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the air for food, the flesh of your faithful to the wild animals of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a taunt to our neighbors, mocked and derided by those around us. How long, O oh Lord? Will you be angry forever? Will your jealous wrath burn like fire? Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you, and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember against us the iniquities of our ancestors. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. Let the groans of the prisoners come before you. According to your great power, preserve those doomed to die. Return sevenfold into the bosom of our neighbors the taunts with which they taunted you, O Lord. Then we, your people, the flock of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. Our final reading is from Psalm 86, verses 1 through 13. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. 
you are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. The Psalms, a book of worship, filled with songs to be sung, poetry to be shared aloud, and offered in private prayer. The Psalms give voice and text to the full range of human emotions. They were written long ago, and yet they shed light on feelings we struggle to express, whether in our moments of triumph or depths of sadness. This is week three of Singing the Lord's Song and following the lead of Walter Brueggemann's book, Spirituality of the Psalms, this week's emphasis are the Psalms of Disorientation. You may know them more commonly by the words complaint or lament. Out of 150 Psalms, 42 fall into the lament category, nearly one third of them. Our ancestors did not shy away from bringing praise and adoration to God, but not only that, their darkest thoughts of fear, envy, grief, and anger. They did not presume all was cheery in the kingdom of God, for these complaints occupy a significant portion of their book of worship. Perhaps that is why I so love to sing this hymn, My Life Flows On. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentations. I hear the clear, though far off hymn that hails a new creation. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Even amidst grief, doubt, troubles, the words of our faith provide comfort, hope, assurance in the God who created, loves, shelters, and cares for us. As a church and denomination, our services are filled with a predominance of praise and adoration. It seems we avoid passages in the Bible with uncomfortable topics or phrases, for they are a struggle to read and understand. Believe me, 
There have been many sighs of relief when in a disciple Bible study class, we finish the Old Testament portion. It can be dreary hearing repeated warnings by the prophets and the anticipated lack of response by the Israelites. Can't we just skip over the exodus, the exile, the destruction of the temple? Let's get to Jesus. In a word, no. For we cannot fully know joy or peace unless we have experienced sorrow and sadness. Context changes the image from pen and ink to a watercolor or oil image. So why does our limited G seemingly overflow with praise, adoration, wonder, awe? Brueggemann in the spirituality of Psalms offers a suggestion regarding this, and I quote, I think the serious religious use of the complaint Psalms has been minimal because we have believed that faith does not mean to acknowledge and embrace negativity. We have thought that acknowledgement of negativity was somehow an act of unfaith, as though the very speech about it conceded too much about God's loss of control. The Psalms are a treasure trove of poetry, poetry meant to express emotions, reveal a different perspective on life, perhaps causing us to learn something new about ourselves or God or about our relationship with God. I want to offer that God doesn't lose control as we or the psalmist might perceive it, but rather our personal loss of control may be the actual obstacle. God is and always has been the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, creator of all that lives and breathes on the earth. We are more comfortable when the focus is on the positive, and yet the messy, complicated, and tragic events of life are when we most need a listening, loving, caring ear. Brueggemann uses the title Psalms of Disorientation. Now, if you've ever been in an accident or are suspected of having a concussion, it is commonplace to have the following questions asked of you. What's your name? Where are you? What day and time is it? Person, place, and time. If, su if successfully answered, you are oriented times three. But it seems to me the hardest times in life come when person, time, and place are in order, but your place in the world, in your family, your personal health, satisfaction at work, or your relationship with God are in turmoil. I had to Google and found Merriam-Webster defines disorientation as a state of having lost one's sense of direction, to be lost, without a compass, no illumination on the path before us, cold, hungry, seeking shelter, tired, scared, angry, looking for home when home is either obscured or unrecognizable. That's disoriented. In the book of Psalms, we find a model of where to go in times of disorientation. The psalmist and our ancestors took their pain directly to God. There was no concern for political correctness. They spoke straight from the heart. And isn't that necessary in any relationship, but especially one grounded in a covenant? For God is who they trusted in, found strength in, and ultimately wanted comfort from. Their prayers and songs are our prayers and songs, our book of worship. And in them, our ancestors gave name to the breadth and scope of human emotions. They trusted God with their most personal and painful of thoughts. In Psalm 13, the psalmist complains, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul? Feelings of abandonment, 
great sorrow, rejection, and yet it seems in the course of naming these most private of thoughts, a change is occurring in the soul of the wounded. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. In Psalm 79, the psalmist is grieving over the devastation and destruction of Jerusalem. The Babylonian assault has left the temple in ruins, and the remnant of Israel is marching on foot to Babylon. Psalm 79 is a communal complaint asking for retribution against the same enemies, and yet, at the conclusion of the chapter, the psalmist again speaks to God, bargaining still, but attempting to close the distance. Return sevenfold into the bosom of our neighbors the taunts with which they taunted you, O Lord. Then we, your people, the flock of your pasture, will give thanks to you forevermore. Finally, in Psalm 86, we hear the psalmist pleading with God, Incline your ear, O Lord, answer me, for I am poor and needy. Be gracious to me, Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. With every utterance of despair, there is an equally strong expectation that the psalmist will be listened to until we hear these words of hope and assurance near the end of that chapter. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, for great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Call it a song, the Lord's song. What flows through our life and sustains us is that steadfastness of God, the knowledge that regardless of circumstance, attitude, confusion, or despair, that God loves us and holds us in the warmth of an embrace. Whether you are navigating personal difficulties, have concern about our, our denomination's future, are horrified at the images and reports coming from Afghanistan, weep for the residents of Haiti, leave them with God. God can handle it. God loves us. God hears us. God listens to us. God can handle the worst we have to offer. God is the rock to which we cling. And when we are brave enough, the very naming of our doubts and fears can be the very thing that frees us, that leads us home, that puts the world back on its axis, that provides the hope of restoring our orientation. Are we singing the Lord's song? If only to give voice to the thoughts in our head of sadness and despair. Until our hearts and soul can sing with equal enthusiasm. Oh, may it be true for each and every one of us. Amen.